listing the properties. That'll bring Keller Williams' 180,000 or so agents into competition with tech companies like Zillow and Open Door and Offerpad, who are doing something similar. Marketplace's Amy Scott explains why a brick and mortar realtor is getting into business that was pioneered. You pay attention with so much at stake. Seas are rising and chronic flooding will be the new normal. You navigate, you listen, you keep an ear out. You pay attention, and so do we. We tell the stories of our time every day. In the 26th day of testimony, and on the 139th witness, Shahar Zarnayev wept. We unearth what would otherwise stay hidden. There's just a lot of hate in this world, and that day, for that hour, we were humans. Across the street, the Red Sox have won the World Series. And around the globe. It's here and now. This is Modern Love. This is WBUR's All Things Considered. This is only a game. This is On Point. This is Radio Boston. On air, online, on demand, and on stage in the heart of Boston. I'm Jack Lepiars. Welcome to WBUR City Space. Always looking forward, paying attention, and knowing that your story is one of our stories. Good morning. I'm Bob Epps. I'm Lisa Mullins. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. I'm Jeremy Hobson. This is 90.9 WBUR, Boston. Clap, clap. Hello, my name is Amy McDonald. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at WBUR. How many people, is this your first time here? Oh, a lot of you. Um, so we're in our second month. We opened um, in February 28th was our public opening, and then we started programming March 3rd. Do go to our website, wbur.org slash events or slash city space, or just go on the WBUR site and look for city space and see what we have coming up. I'd like to think that this will be the 92nd Street Y of Boston. We have had uh, discussions on um, policy. We have had uh, live podcasts. We have had a dance performance. We had a coffee house opera that Steph introduced our moderator tonight. We've had um, moth story slams, the second Wednesday of every month. We're having the live uh, local moth storytelling here. Uh, we have curated cuisine the first Monday of every month. We're having local chefs come and talk about food, and then we serve their, we serve Joanne Chang's um, sticky buns afterwards. So we're doing so many things and thinking outside the box. And so when Mary was coming, Mary Norris, I said, let's get Greek food. And I wanted to get Greek music as well, but we're still in the process of getting licensing to play music that is approved. So. Anyway, um, it's great fun. It's very exciting. Thank you for coming. Uh, what you hear inside, you also hear outside. There are double pane windows here because we do do radio broadcasts here as well. So you don't hear an ambulance. You don't hear a fire engine. You do hear the rumble of the tea. When the, when the sun goes down, this really pops, the screen. It's such a streetscape. And you'll see everyone coming by on the tee, and their faces are glued to the window to see what's going on here. And so you'll see people stop and wonder, what's going on? And so it's a great guerrilla marketing. Anyway, thank you for coming. Um, Mary will be signing books afterwards, and we will have more Greek food if you're still hungry. And I'd like to introduce Mary Nor Norris and Steph Katanis. Am I saying your name right? Starts. Scott Sonis, a uh, Greek American and a producer for On Point, and I knew he'd be the perfect person for this. <laughs> Let's sit on the you want me in the far chair? <laughs> no, I'll go to the far chair. Okay. <clears throat> but also, we have, if you go to your phones and type in slido.com, you can type in your questions during the uh, program, and they'll go up on the stage. And there's a, a, a we have um, the, we're going to put it up right now. The <coughs> passcode for Slido is, Slido. type that in. It'll automatically come up to this event, and you can type your question. And so we'll be doing both. We can be taking your questions live, a, uh, or you can just come up here. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I like this. <laughs> That'd be good, Mary. Down you go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> We're delighted to have Mary Norris here with us, aren't we? Yes. 
the comma Thank queen you. and everything else. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> So I'm not going to spend much time introducing Mary because you know her better than I. I'll give you a couple of very basic facts. Born 1952, Cleveland. Her favorite job was yes. being a milkman. She can tell you all about being a milkman, and don't we miss the milkman? I do. I still remember them. She joined the New Yorker in 1978. Uh, in 2015, her book, huge success, Between You and Me, Confessions of a Comma Queen, and now Greek to Me, Adventures of a Comma Queen. So... We're going to talk about a few things, and you'll get to ask your questions later. So, Mary, this is about Greece and your experience of Greece and your experience of the many facets of Greece and the language. So let's start with how did you come to it? How did you come to fall in love and kind of delve into Greek, Greece, Greek culture? Well, I decided I wanted to go to Greece after seeing a movie, Time Bandits, <laughs> where there was this, you know, this movie, Terry Gilliam, and it had a few people from... Monty Python, Flying Circus in it. And there was a scene, a cameo with Sean Connery as Agamemnon. And he was dueling with the uh, Minotaur, uh, sort of, you know, guy with a big bull head on. And um, that, well, you know, it was beautiful to watch. But what really got me was the background of it. It was very, I want to say, elemental, just earth and sky. And the earth was, there was no grass. It was kind of deserty looking, very sere. Turned out, <coughs> I found out years later that the movie was shot in Morocco. <coughs> but I thought it was Greece. And I, I was working at the New Yorker. And I had a boss who was a Phil Helene. And I came in the next day and said, I want to go to Greece. He showed me on a map of Europe where he had gone to Greece. And he'd been many times. And then he took a book out of his shelf, which was called A Modern Greek reader for beginners, and it had Greek letters in it, and he started reading it out loud and translating it, and it had not, up till that point, occurred to me that I could learn Greek. If, if he had learned Greek, well, it must be possible to learn Greek. So I took a course, and I studied. Where, where did you take I, The first course was at NYU's School of mm -hmm. Continuing Education. It was a night course for adults, and it was this was 1982. <clears throat> And there was at that time, well, you know the state of the Greek language. Um, it had been katharevousa, that was this very purified form of Greek that was supposed to link the Greeks to their classical heritage and keep Turkish words out of the language. Um, that had just been um, removed as the state, of the, as the official language of, of Greece. All the people spoke what is known as Demotic Greek. Anyway, there were no textbooks in Demotic Greek. At that point, I don't think there was a good Greek-American dictionary that used Demotic Greek. Not a great Greek. one, yeah. So we used, the class had um, um, photocopied lessons in, mostly in words for travel. The people in that class, uh, always when you take a Greek class, a, mo a class in modern Greek. There's somebody who is marrying into a Greek family, you know, and is trying to do her best to impress her mother-in-law. And, and also, there will be Greeks who grew up hearing Greek but feel they don't know the grammar, and they want to go back and study it. And then I, stu I did that for a while. Then I found a wonderful tutor up at Barnard who taught me a lot, Dorothy Gregory. And then I went to Greece after a year of study. And I did really fall in love. I fell in love with the sea, I think, more than anything else. It just, you know, I took. Describe the water. I thought people, I mean, as beautiful as Cape Cod is, describe the water of Greece. Well, if you take a ferry any, in, into the Aegean, um, you know, you get to stare at the water. And this, um, the water is the purest blue I've ever seen. And it's all shades of blue. You know, you've got your sky blue, you've got marine blue, you've got turquoise mm -hmm. along the edges, mm -hmm. and it's completely mesmerizing to look at all these different shades of blue. So when I came, I, I decided on that trip that when I got back, I wanted to study ancient Greek because I wanted to share with the people <coughs> who had been on this sea before me, you know, everything they'd read, they'd written and they read. And I haven't obviously read everything, but I did study ancient Greek at Columbia when I got home. 
And then I kept switching back and forth, and I got them totally muddled, <laughs> which is not good. As, as everybody else in Greece did, right, Thanai? She's a, <laughs> who went to, Thanai is a member of your audience. She went to school with me in sixth grade in Greece during the dictatorship years, and believe me, they managed to com completely confuse us with the Katharevus and the Demotic and all this stuff. Anyway, continue, sorry. Next question. <laughs> well, the next question was, how did you convince the New Yorker to pay for you to study? Oh, well, the New Yorker had always had a very um, liberal stance. They had this um, idea that anything that helped an employee with her work, a uh, class that you took, they would reimburse you for it. And they had reimbursed me for modern Greek. It was just once a week at uh, NYU. So I, when I started at Columbia, I just blithely handed in the bill, which was for considerably more than it had been at NYU. And um, there was a new executive editor, and he turned me down. And I was on the copy desk then, and I was aghast. He said that he didn't see the relevance of ancient Greek to my job on the copy desk. So he was tangling with the wrong person. <laughs> um, I started keeping a dossier of words that came up in my work that had Greek roots. Like, and you know, of course, they're legion. <laughs> Ophthalmologist. I had just learned the Greek for ophthal for eyes, ophthalmos, and it's O P H T H A L M O S. Often misspelt. That P H is just rendered as a P. There was a word in the works of John McPhee, um, who has written a lot about geology, the word autochthonous, auto, self, clonos, the earth. And that's spelt with a C-H-T-H-O-N-O, clonos. So um, it means something like self-generated from the earth. And once you know that word, and you can throw it around a little, it is a great pleasure. So, and there was also just pi. Um, and things like Hoya socks. There's some Hoya socks. There's some um, team. Georgetown. Yes. What is their motto? Hoya socks. Hoya socks. Yes. Um, you know that comes up once in a while, and uh, people want to know how to spell it. Hoy poloi. Do you put the the in front of it when hoy means the. these? So. <laughs> Anyway, um, I also got the New Yorker's head grammarian, Eleanor Gould, to write a letter testifying to the value of ancient Greek. <laughs> and I put this whole package together, and I gave it to the guy. And an editor said, you know, you're using a cannon to shoot a flea. <laughs> it worked. They paid. They reimbursed me for that class. And so for years to come, I, I studied at Columbia. I had a... Um, the job on the copy desk had a night shift, so I was free to go up to Morningside Heights and take a class on Mondays and Wednesdays. And I, I found once, um, pretty early on, a poster on campus that was advertising auditions for Euripides Electra in ancient Greek. And I'd never studied a dead language before, so I miss those things you do when you study a language. You know, you put on skits and, and things like that. And, and I figured, well, this a play in ancient Greek, that'll be as close as I can come to conversational ancient Greek. It's dialogue, right? So I got a part in the chorus. And, and the next year, I got plucked from the chorus and given the lead in the Trojan Women. I was the only one old enough to play Hecuba. <laughs> so I Remember had, any of your lines? Um, Oh, to, 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 to. That's what she says. <laughs> Which is kind of like oy vey in ancient Greek. Is that what it is? It's oy oy boy, yes. <laughs> so um, um, I'd, I'd just like to mention and go back. She was talking about how many English words there were. I remember in, 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 in university taking a biology course, and it would drive my classmates nuts. They'd be sitting next to me. The professor would introduce a new term like sinocytic, and I'd say, oh, he means common cell, which means common cell, and because these poor bastards couldn't remember. It was a struggle to memorize these terms, and it just, it's just so easy once you have Greek under your belt. You now, all those words, like, I, I fell in love even before I thought of studying ancient Greek. I fell in love with the word otorhinolaryngologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oto, rhino. Laryngologist. Um, your nose and throat. Your nose, in English, an E-N-T. Yeah. That's got a lot of poetry in it, right? <laughs> um, 
But I, I thought for a long time that all those words with Greek roots were actually from the ancient Greek. I, and it took me a while to realize that Demosthenes probably did not consult an otorhinolaryngologist <laughs> for his throat problems, and that those words were made up from the Greek roots by uh, academics and physicians and classicists as the specialties came into being, like your cito. Sinocytic, C-O-E-N-O-C-Y-T-I-C. It was like cell structures where they have the walls break down, so it's like one, it's like a bunch of cells that become one continuous cell somehow. And I do not remember what organism that was to be found. But anyway, <laughs> let me ask you something actually, since we're talking about the spelling. When I grew up, you used to spell esophagus as O-E, esophagus. Oh. And you used to spell ether as A-E and so on and so forth. And now we're just ether is E and esophagus is E. When did that change? O comma queen. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was alive in the 19th century, we decided that, that we didn't need all those extra vowels. Um, I don't know is the answer. But the New Yorker does subscribe to that. Um, archaeologist, we don't use the A-E in archaeologist, just the E. Uh. Ether, um, I'm not sure. Well, here's another one. Feces. <laughs> We just spell F-E-E. Oh, right, F-E-E. Oh, right. yes, right. always... That's a good Greek word. I, <laughs> yes. Actually, I don't know. It's, it this might is... be Latin. Um, I'm sure that they took it out just because, just for reasons of pronunciation. Maybe, you know, it might have been good old Noah Webster who decided we could do it. Well, it felt like it was like the 80s or something. I just, because I remember growing up seeing those words that way. And then now you don't. So maybe it's more there recent. There was some modernization yeah, at some yeah. point, yeah. We gave up a kind of here in English too, didn't we? Right, right, we exactly. Yeah. So, okay, so what, was, what year was your first trip to Greece? 1983. I went to Athens and then took a ferry to Crete, and then took a ferry from the other end of Crete to Rhodes, and then to Cyprus, then back up through Rhodes and up to the Dodecanese to Samos, Chios, Lesbos, and then to Kushadasi to see Turkey. Troy. I wanted to follow in the footsteps of Homer, and um, I had read the Iliad in translation and wanted to see those sites um, of Asia Minor, which, you know, that all used to be Greece. Greece, yeah. Uh, and then to uh, Constantinopoli, <laughs> and over around to Thessaloniki and the Spor Sporadis. Sporadis, the islands, right? Um, the islands, one of them is called Skiathos, beautiful islands. And then down through Delphi and the Peloponnese and back to Athens. It was five weeks. It was a, <laughs> a hell of a lot of trip. places in five weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, how old were you, if I may ask, at that time? 30-something, 30, 30, 31. So like experientially, what was it like to say, okay, I finally made it, here I am, look at the sunlight, look at these hills, look at the smell, the smell the smells. What was it like for you? you and, and you're racing from place to place. Was it like, were you voracious? Or were you saying, oh, I want to stay put for a while, it's a pity I've planned this trip to, you know, why didn't you stay in places? Um, there were always temptations to stay in places, but I had this major itinerary. I was meeting some friends in Thessaloniki. They had gotten married. I was on their honeymoon with them. And, but I had skipped the wedding because I knew I wanted to cover all this territory before meeting them on their honeymoon. And I just, I'd been kind of trapped in Cleveland as as a, a a young girl my father didn't believe he didn't believe in travel he'd been in the second world war he'd been a soldier uh, in england and at um, the d-day invasion and ended up for a while in adak alaska and he just thought travel sucked <laughs> <laughs> so he wouldn't ever take us we went to um, niagara falls once but I'd been there, I'd been to Detroit, and I'd been to Columbus. So when I finally got to go places, you know, when I finally had a job and some money saved up and some paid vacation, I wanted to see everything I could. I packed a lot of things in. So um, I also had at that time a terrible case of eye strain from my work. And I was always looking at stuff that was just 12 inches from my nose, reading tiny print. If you're fans of The New Yorker, you may remember the old goings-on department, which was tiny print and many, many columns. It was my job to proofread that. And it was before anyone thought to use a Xerox machine to enlarge 
<laughs> so I had like this huge magnifying glass and mm. a light beam. I probably burnt my eyes out doing that job. But I had chronic eye strain. And so for me to rest my eyes on a beautiful horizon was my idea of a vacation. It was all I wanted to do. So I went to beaches. I looked at the sea, um, the famous light of Greece. I had always thought that that meant it would be bright. But it's not. It's a soft, beautiful light that just kind of bounces off things and gives them halos. Um, and of course, there were the sunset. smells and the sunsets and the sunrises. Oh, uh, you're covering too much ground. Smells. Let's dwell upon smells for a little bit. What's, what does Greece smell like? Well, Athens, to me, smelled piney. You know, it's a dry climate. Yeah. And there are those pines in the hills. Yes. And since it, it, Athens has changed a lot since I saw it in 1983, the, there are plantings now along <clears> this big promenade around the uh, Acropolis with a, a wild oregano and thyme and rosemary, all of those wonderful smells. And uh, of course, there's the smell of ouzo, yeah. Uh, yeah. licorice smell, um, and uh, flowers. It's a little hard. Well, uh, I believe I've seen um, wisteria, yeah. the bur beautiful purple thing. In, in Greece, and that has a wonderful smell. But you've got to get to Greece pretty early in the season to get the flowers yes. because it gets hot and they dry up pretty yeah. fast. In fact, it's got one of the, um, supposedly one of the world's greatest um, uh, collections of wildflowers precisely because it's that kind of arid climate, sort of similar to north, northern, northern uh, California. So because the dry season comes so quickly, the plants have learned they have to blossom mm. and compete for as much bee contact as it can possibly get. So it's so it, it, it explodes in a matter of days, and then they're gone again, yeah. But in the summertime, I mean, I think we should explain to these people, they have not smelt a melon or a fig or a, oh. the, the way that smell would waft, and the jasmine and the... Um, the grapes. It would, the smell on, in an August day, if you're near a field of melons, or if you're in town, it's, it, it's different, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Carpusia. Carpusia, yeah. Now, okay, now I'm, I'm sure an intrepid traveler like you did not feel vulnerable, but how was it being a young woman in her 30s traveling Greece alone and going wherever she wanted? Did you feel vulnerable at all? Um, I, I, oddly enough, I was not afraid. Maybe I should have been afraid, but I was not afraid. Um, I'd lived in New York City for <laughs> several years, so I thought the I'd get my too. way around. Um, I would be, what did surprise me, <laughs> was the amount of attention I drew from men, because um, I don't know why that didn't happen in New York. Uh, <laughs> there was maybe too much competition. But they, they liked foreign women. They liked the fair complexion. And, um, and they took me for a German a lot. The first time I sat down on the steps uh, to the Acropolis, somebody who looked Greek addressed me in German. And I, what? <laughs> I didn't come here to speak German. And then I realized, it, and it took me a while, that he was just trying to pick me up, and he thought I was German. Yeah. Um, but everywhere I went, somebody would try to lure me you know, into a cave or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned pretty quickly you know, that I needed to stick to my plan. Yeah. Um, and you know, I might have missed some opportunities by sticking to my plan, but you know, I got a tour of, how do you pronounce knossos? I say knossos in Greek, knossos. You do pronounce the K? Yeah. Oh, but the accent is on the... On the second syllable, no yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Anyway, I've been pronouncing that wrong all my life. But um, I met somebody on the ship, the ferry from Piraeus to Crete, who squired me around Heraklion and um, offered me a tour of Knossos. And that it didn't end very well. He took me right into the cave of the Minotaur. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know... Pressed his lips against yours. <laughs> Were there, did you Not meet all. any? No, uh, no, no. <laughs> did you meet any great charmers? Oh yes, there were many charming Greek. I found all the the Greek people very very intelligent, very sharp. I didn't meet very many women because I think they were still in the home. They were still young. Yeah, they, didn't, that they didn't get out a lot. Yeah. Uh, but the waiters were all very charming, yeah. and yeah. I had. Um, some wonderful experiences when I was in Cyprus, which is a very beautiful place. It would be being the birthplace of Aphrodite. 
I, um, I, was dr I drove around there, and I was driving from the port. I rented a car, drove to Paphos, where there are these amazing Roman mosaics that I wanted to see. And I noticed on the way there that I thought my, front, my headlights weren't working. And um, when I got to Paphos, well, the headlights were not working. I actually, <laughs> the, you know, this, and it was getting really dark. I turned down a residential street and went to a house with a light on to ask for help to get me to my hotel. And this whole family came out, got in their car, and led me to my hotel. And I went from there to a little place to get something to eat. And there happened to be two guys there, a fisherman and a mechanic, who said, we'll take a look at your headlights, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Let me have a look at your headlights. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I went um, to their garage the next day, and they fixed the headlights, but they were really trying to keep me around. They wanted me to go on the boat fishing with them. Hmm. And you know, they were nice. They gave me, you know, finished vodka, you know, 10 o'clock in the hmm. morning. I shot Whoa. Vodka. And I kept saying, I can't drink, I have to drive. But I, was, I didn't get back in the wheel, behind the wheel of that car for hours. You know, I would have had time for a few more shots of vodka, actually. <laughs> anyway, they, they would try to waylay me, and I persisted on my... You remained a good way. Catholic girl. Yes. Well, I, would, I didn't say Chased. that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to cover my territory. I did yeah, not want yeah, to... Yeah. Maybe now I would go and stay in Paphos for two weeks, but at that time when I was 31, I only had a night, a right. single night. Yeah. You know, if, when you, if you read the book, you'll find that, uh, that Mary traveled alone a lot, and that's something that I wanted to ask you about because, you know, I like the journey as much as the next guy, but, but, uh, but I mean, traveling alone sometimes, sitting at a restaurant by myself, for me feels lonely, but you liked it, right? So tell me about traveling and traveling mm -hmm. alone and the reason and how you enjoy the solitude. And I did not actually initially enjoy going in restaurants by myself. I was an object of a lot of attention. And also, I, in order to have the different foods that I liked, I had to order a whole lot of food because the Greek seat family style. <laughs> you know, you're weird sitting there by yourself. Uh, but And the other reason I was traveling alone, the main reason I was traveling alone is is because my itinerary was so crazy, nobody wanted to go with me. You know, I was alone because I was alone. But one of the things I came to enjoy about traveling alone is that this way, and I only discovered it once, I, once in a while when I traveled with someone, when you're with somebody from home, you never lose that part of you that wants to do the things you do at home. You know, you'll fulfill your friend's expectations. You eat the kind of food that you eat at home. You, um, you insist on having your coffee or your tea, which is really stupid. And most of all, you're speaking your native tongue with mm -hmm, the person mm -hmm. that you're with. Whereas when you're alone, you have to go and engage with the people that, you're, that, that live there, who live there. Otherwise, you really are alone. And I don't like to be alone that much. You know, I like to talk to people. Mm -hmm. So... That sense of alienation of being the, the a stranger there also gave me um, some. I think that has to be one of the essential parts of travel: is seeing what you're like against the background of the strange place that you're in, and you're the stranger, you know, not mm -hmm. not them. Mm -hmm. So. You know, we were talking, we met beforehand uh, to, to, to get to know each other before this event, and we were talking a little bit about all these ideas. And one of the things that came up was this notion that travel and alienation is so is threaded throughout Greek culture, from ancient culture to modern culture. In the ancient times, of course, Odyssey, right? Colonizing lands across the Mediterranean. Then in modern times, you had the Greeks who were forced to go and work in Canada, the United States, Australia, and Germany as Gostar biters, and the sense of travel and alienation, and kind of, and the merchant marine, by the way, there's a huge merchant marine in, uh, in, in Greece. Uh, that was, that's a big theme, that sense of traveling, adventuring, and the loneliness that comes with, and almost enjoying the loneliness, right? Well, sometimes being alone is preferable to being like <laughs> with the Cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> I would prefer that. Um, but what you were saying, that there's that wonderful Greek word, the diaspora, you know, 
and we think um, often more of the Jewish diaspora, but it's a Greek word, dia, through, and spora, that we mentioned the spora, sporades. Yeah. It just means um, like sown yeah. in the sense of seeds that are sown, spread. tossed out, spread out, and that's what they were, the Greeks were spread throughout the world. It was yeah. the diaspora. Yeah. It's a beautiful word. They do, though, am I not right? Once they get someplace, they stick together, the Greeks? Yeah, well, that, yeah, there's sort of, again, there's Greeks and there's Greeks. <laughs> and they're the ones who say, I want to get away from every other Greek, and I have my own trip. And then the Greeks who stay together very tight in the community. You'll, be, you'll hear, uh, uh, you'll have uh, immigrant communities here where you know, the old aunt so-and-so still, after 40 years, doesn't speak a word of English. They go to the church together, they eat together. There's a very strong sense of preserving the culture to the extent that we were talking again about this too. Uh, when, we, when I was young in Greece, my mother, who is uh, Canadian Greek, used to get <laughs> really incensed because Greeks have a habit of referring, if, if a Greek travels to Chicago and he is the only person who is Greek in the town, he'll still chat with another, or one of two, let's say, let's say the two Greeks. They'll refer to all the Chicagoans as the, as the foreigners. And my mother said, wait a minute, you're the foreigner, man. <laughs> They're not the foreigners, you're the foreigner. But there's this Greek notion of everybody else is foreign, uh, right? <laughs> so um, oh, I'm looking for what I want to go to next with you here. So that we were started to talk about traits, about Greeks, Greekness. We were also talking about that, right? The idea of the body with bodiness, you know, base mm -hmm. jokes and all stuff with the elevated. Do you, do you find, do you enjoy that? Oh, yes. Um, well, that kind of seems inherent in the Greek character, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah. the Greeks are very proud to have the um, achievements in art and theater and math and all those things from ancient times. But the Greeks are also very earthy. Mm. And, um, you know, well, they don't all take after Aristophanes, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of earthiness in the humor there. And still, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's, um, well, I contributed to that myself. How did you do that? <laughs> Accidentally, from oh. time to time. Um, just by putting the accent on the wrong word. I <laughs> sometimes say something. Um, I got the word, I, there's the word forget and the word exekasa. And then there's another way. I was trying to tell the woman who was cleaning the room in the hotel that I had forgotten something in the room, and I accidentally said, I threw up in the room. <laughs> 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 the expression on her face was... <laughs> 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 Bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back later. <laughs> Did Greeks like your trying your your efforts at Greek? Did they yes. were they were they, were yes. they accepting and helpful? The very very much so. I mean, they thought it was funny. These two men in Cyprus were so nice to me because my Greek was that of a four year old child, and they would talk very slowly and precisely and had great patience with me, and. Um, my, you know, my, the thing that I found myself saying most often was, then katalava, I don't understand. Mm. Because I would ask a question, I'd formulate a question in Greek, and if they didn't answer what I wanted them to say, I wouldn't understand. So mm -hmm. then katalava mm -hmm. became a joke. It was a great, do you remember that song? Do you remember that song? It was a, it was a <laughs> pop number in the 70s or so. I don't understand anything. Anyway, <laughs> so that should become your anthem there. Like so um, we were talking, so we talked bodiness, um, arguing. How did you find Greeks and the way they talked and argued and debated? It scared me a little. The Greek men in the Café Neon always sound like they're yelling at each other. Yeah. And it's just, um, it's just cultural. They just talk loud, and they do disagree a lot. <laughs> but it's not violent. It just is um, sometimes louder than you expect. Um, I remember w waking up in a hotel, a very crude sort of hotel room in a town way in the mountains in Cyprus, and the Greek men in the Café Neon across the road, they sounded like birds twittering to me. Very, mm. very beautiful. Mm. The language has a... A, a real rhythm to it, a very yeah. light, a kind of a dancing yeah, rhythm yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, you hear sure. people. It's all short vowels, so you have a chance of dun da 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 yeah. mm -hmm. um, So you mentioned in the book that uh, the goddess Athena was a role model for you. Yes. And maybe the proto-feminist in a way. Explain that. Well, I think it began with reading the Odyssey 
and seeing that Athena would always come to the aid of Odysseus, loved, I fell in love, I had a little crush on Odysseus, and, um, and all, somehow I wanted Athena, I wanted to be like Athena, and I wanted Athena to like me. I, it's all a little bit mixed up and full of reflections, mm-hmm. but Athena is, the, is a master of disguise. She's always appearing as um, somebody else, or an animal, or a little girl, or a woman, or a man. And um, she, her role is really to give advice to Odysseus and help him. She does it in, um, people forget this, in the Iliad, too. It's Athena who, right at the beginning, when Achilles is mad and he's, he's just going to kill Agamemnon and get it all over with, you know, you know it's not going to happen because it's just book one. You know? <laughs> There's a whole lot left. It's not going to happen. But uh, Athena stops him. She just He feels her hand on his arm, and she says, don't do it. And, and so he, he doesn't. And she's always telling Odysseus, you know, don't barge in there and ask for a ship to go home. <laughs> go in, um, beseech the queen. The way to the king is through the queen. You know? <laughs> and strategize. It's all, you know, Athena is a, a warrior goddess, but she would avoid violence if she could. Mm-hmm. You know, she would first try um, di- diplomacy. She's also the goddess of wisdom and of education. And when I was um, a proofreader at The New Yorker, I had these, you know, I was always looking for some kind of model who, that was, who was the, a person who was diplomatic. There were none. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was the, you know, I, 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 it was like, trying to get between Scylla and Charybdis because there was some, you know, Scylla was this sphinx-like woman of such a cold intelligence that if you asked her a question, you know, she could just melt you with her look like, you don't know that. <laughs> and the other one... Um, so she was the one who was in Mensa or something? Yes. Yeah, what was her name? She was uh, Eleanor, Gould. Eleanor Gould. She was a member not only of Mensa, but of a group within Mensa that was smarter than the other people <laughs> in Mensa. She was really smart. And the other one, Lou Burke, was had not, nobody knew this, it was, I don't know that it was a secret, but nobody knew it. She had not gone to college. Huh? She'd gone to some kind of school for bad girls where she learned to ride horses, and then she got a job. She did have something of the cowboy about her, now I think <laughs> of it. But she got a job at a publishing house. She worked at Life, and she ended up at the um, New Yorker. And she hated a lot of things about New Yorker style, but it was her job to enforce them anyway. And um, Lou had no, she had a very bad temper. She once hurled a dictionary at uh, the head of somebody who was proofreading because the proofreader, this was way back, was wearing um, earphones and listening to uh, the radio, but only because her favorite show was on for the last time and she didn't want to miss it. But Lou thought, you can't proofread. You can't be serious proofreading listen to the radio at the same time. Oh, boy, would she go crazy in the office now? Everybody has has earphones on. But anyway, I I knew I couldn't be like Eleanor. I was not smart enough, and I didn't want to be like Lou. I didn't want to be that mean. I could have been. (laughs) But So Athena was like the middle way. Athena just was a way to um, get the work done without being intimidated by anybody and without, you know, uh, worrying about whether people liked you or not. I, you know, think of her role among the gods. She, Athena is, is um, like pure intellect in a way. She came out of Zeus's head. Mm-hmm. And she had no mother. Her mother was Metis, who was one of the titans, I think. And Zeus had swallowed her while she was pregnant. So she wasn't around when Athena was growing up. So Athena didn't have to cope with a lot of conflicts with her mother. And she got along with Hera, Zeus's wife. And they were, off, they were um, allies during the Trojan War. So she had a directness about her that I thought, I continue to think, was a good model. I think she is like the patron goddess of copy editors. Mm -hmm. So now one thing, and this is where your auditions far surpasses mine, so I hope you can answer this. I've always been confused. 
<laughs> if Athena was about dr- truth and justice, why did she like a, a rake like Odysseus who would lie and scheme and connive? Why did she protect him so much? Why didn't she say, straighten, your, straighten up and dr- fly right, you know? The lovely thing about Athena, and this is true also of Hermes, is that they liked mortals. Yeah. Um, lots of the gods would just play with them and, you know, <laughs> let them die, let them live once in a while. <clears throat> If, well, if it was one of the sons of Zeus, then he would be protective and consider saving the life. But mostly, it, it was really just Athena and Hermes who seemed to enjoy trips to, you know, trips down from Olympus to mingle with the mortals. Um, there, and I'm sure that there was something about the man of many turnings that. Um, Odysseus that Athena actually admired. He had the potential to be wise and to act wisely. Hmm. So I think she saw that in him and she Athena helped make Odysseus, I think. Hmm. Hmm. By the way, did you ever get anywhere near Mount Olympus? Uh, Mount Olympus is in the north, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was in Thessaloniki yeah, you were close. So I was close. I'd never climbed it. Yeah. Are, the, are, the, is, are the God's Palace still up there? Are they still have everything? Oh, they certainly are. <laughs> no, where I did go was Mount Dicta in Crete, which uh-huh. is where they say Zeus was hidden away in a cave and raised by a she-goat. What is it with goats? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is it with our fascination with goats? But um, how, did, you went to Delphi, obviously. You've mentioned it before. I did. How did you f- explain that? Did you, what time of year were you there, first mm-hmm. of all? Well, my first trip was in April and May, which is a wonderful time to go to Greece. So it's still a little misty and it's mysterious? It's still not that hot. There are still wildflowers, and there are not hordes of tourists. Tourists yeah. like to come in yeah. June and yeah. July. And I'm, I have been there in August because I wanted to go sometime when the figs were ripe. You know? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's yeah. really wonderful. My experience in Delphi, though, was a little, um, I was a little ambivalent about Delphi because... Um, it seemed to me that everybody lied in Delphi. You know, I went into tourist uh, uh, business. You mean the Greeks? Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. the restaurant owners and the hotel owners. You know, they'd say we don't have a room for you until I don't know. They would, they would just get the most money they could mm-hmm. out of you, which I guess is fair. Um, but they they had, for instance, in a restaurant, some sullen young men would get up and shuffle around as if they were dancing <laughs> rhapsodically, and they were not. You know, they had just been brought in, show these tourists you can dance and maybe make a little money. But I did have one wonderful experience with, um, in Delphi, there's a, a temple to Athena there. You know, the big one is, of course, Apollo and the Mount Parnassus behind him, and then the sea out in front of it. But down the road, there's a little round temple called the Tholos. Its roof is missing, of course, but it, they've reconstructed some columns and the shape of it. And there was a guard there, and I went to talk to him. I, I mean, I went to visit the temple, and he was there to talk to. And he was one of the, I think he'd have married me. <laughs> they tell you, he, in those days, I don't know if it's still the same, but the Greeks like to tell you, how many trees they had. Yes, still so. You'd say, I have 10 olive trees. And, you know, and oh. <laughs> um, that, I was impressed. I would love to have 10 olive trees. Um, but he, he, taught, he taught me a little Greek. He taught me that it, um, you know, the word Delphi is plural. So the plural accusative, when you say, you don't say, you're, I'm going to Delphi, you say, I'm going to Delphus. Yeah. It's got that us ending in it, so the, the Greek for to Delphi or in Delphi yeah. is stus delphus, yeah. which is just fun to say, and he taught me to say stus <laughs> And Where and, maybe there will be Zeus. <laughs> <laughs> and he picked up, a f- before I left, he picked up a few little tiny, you know, fingernail-sized rocks, shards for me to, from the temple, and I... Um, I spirited those out of Greece, and I still have them in a very special place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that was the good experience in mm-hmm. Delphi. You know, word to the wise, actually. This comes up a lot. Stus Delphus. Stus Delphus. What Mary mentioned about the, um, you know, some of the dirty tricks of the tourist trade. I, I often tell people that if you're going to go and visit Greece, 
in my opinion, the two best times of year are in the spring when all the flowers and Easter and as you feel life. And in, in dry climates, spring and water and green take on extra meaning because you know they're transient, right? But the other time is, is in mid-September up until mid-October or so. And what's happened, besides the fact that the land has been burnt brown and dusty and dry and there's still some great melons around and the water is the warmest it will be all year, what also happens is the tourist trade, the tourists have come and gone. So all these restaurateurs and hoteliers who sometimes in the thick of the tourist season can be a little underhanded or, or brusque or, you know, they calm down. They've made their peace with, what, with their take for the tourists. <laughs> and they sit back and they relax. It's like an Indian summer and they become nice people again. And then they have time for the visitor who sits, ah, come on, sit down, we'll talk. And, you know, and they do all of this. They don't have that intensity and sometimes, uh, you know, dishonesty. Uh, so if any of you go, mark my words. <laughs> now, describe the, the, the Parthenon, the Acropolis, to our friends who haven't been there. Um, well, if you've been there, you know you can't anymore get very close at all to the Parthenon. You can climb the Acropolis. There are wonderful places to walk around the Acropolis and get up the back way and stuff like that. And the first time I went, <clears throat> I hate to be disappointed by the Acropolis, <laughs> but I couldn't make head or tail of it. You know, it was just, it, it, the, the thing had been bombed, and and at that time, in the 80s, that was when the um, Caryatids oh, yes, they've been taken had, were, had been eaten away by auto emissions. Um, you know, marble you think of as something permanent, but there was terrible damage to the stones on the Acropolis. And there was a tiny little museum up there. Um, anyway, I came back year after year, and you don't go to Athens and not visit the Acropolis, you know, pay your respects. And it changed every year. They, and most recently, um, well, I'm sure you know that a lot of the most wonderful statuary is in London, mm -hmm. is in the British Museum called the Elgin Marbles. So actually my second trip to Greece, I went first to London to <laughs> fill, my, fill in my knowledge of what that stuff was supposed to look like, and then went to Athens and tried to picture it in the, there. Um, the last time I went to Athens, well, you know, they have now this beautiful new Acropolis Museum. Fantastic. It was built around the time of the Olympics, but wasn't yeah. quite finished in yeah. time yeah. for the Olympics. But it is right across from the Acropolis. It's glass, and the statuary from the Acropolis is placed at the same height that it would be if it were still attached mm -hmm. and all in the same order and you can walk around these different levels so you can see things close up in a way that you would not be able to see if they were on the temple. And the karyatids are especially beautiful. You can stand right up behind them and look out and see the beautiful braids on the backs of their heads. So that's really exciting. Also, they have a nice restaurant with craft beer on the roof, <laughs> which is nice. But what I really loved seeing on the Acropolis itself, um, this I was there last in May of 2017, and I tried to get there early because I knew it would get hot. And I got there at 10 o'clock, and it was already hot, and I was already late, and there were already throngs of people going up. And so, OK, I joined the throng. I tried to find a little shade. The work is ongoing. And I suddenly was able to see it for the project that it is, that they're still building it, and that that, in a way, is a form of adoration. You know, that these people, and even the crowd, they're coming from all over the world mm. to climb this hill. The marble is polished so smooth from the feet of the people. You can slip and fall and break your neck. Very slippery. <laughs> the women in the souvenir stand were telling me that it's, you know, it had snowed in Athens that winter, and they tried to close the Acropolis because it was so slippery. But people wouldn't have it. They just, you know, climbed up and slid all over the Acropolis, I guess. Yeah. The, you know, the thing is, is that the Acropolis is one of the things you hear, Acropolis, 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 Parthenon, Parthenon. But <coughs> when you see it, especially on certain days from different parts of the city, it, it, it really is something, you know, the, they're famous, the ancient Greeks, for, for placing temples in, an, in Delphi, the Temple of Poseidon off down in the southern cape of Attica. The Acropolis is so beautifully placed. And when I was a kid, I'm going to make you jealous now. I arrived in 68. And so it was, the city was just beginning to mushroom in size. 
and the worst pollution hadn't happened yet. And so as old and blown apart as the Acropolis was, it was a lot more striking. And you, know, you, could, you really saw the acids eat away at that thing as we grew up. But another thing that I mentioned to Mary before made her very jealous was that when we were kids, what we could do is, you know, teenagers, is sometimes we'd say, oh, let's go catch the sunrise over Falidon. So we'd go and sneak up to the Acropolis and there'd be like one hurricane fence, you lift it up, you all climb underneath. And we'd go and sit on the Parthenon on the steps, you know, like just smoke, we're not supposed to smoke, but we did. And we'd smoke and look at the sunrise. And that's something you just cannot do today. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. We wouldn't stub our cigarettes out on the marble though. <laughs> Always in the dirt. <laughs> Glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So where else was your favorite spot? Um, my favorite spot is usually the last place I've been. In this case, it was how I, I'm not sure how do you pronounce it, Cardamili, 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 which is a little town on the Mani, which is the second, the middle of the three yeah, the peninsulas Peloponnese that kind of like hang this. down under the, and this is being like right a cow's there. udders, except there's like only that. three of them. Yeah. Anyway, this is a very wild one. The Mani is famous for blood feuds that have gone on yep. for generations. There's not a lot of art there. Can I say that? Yep, that's right. <clears throat> but unless you count the art artistry in the stones that they build all of their houses from, they, they have that. <laughs> one thing they are very rich in is stones. And so they um, quarry the stones. And it's like turning the earth inside out to make buildings out of the stones that they got out of the earth and they stitch them back up and uh, that's a word the, uh, the word autochthonous comes in there it's a very autochthonous sort of a scene there with all the it's it's a little the way the Cotswolds are all made out of the rock that comes from those mountains but um, it all and they, they have they make jokes in the stone the whoever has made the stone will um, sculpt say, a, a, a sailboat in stone, which is a crazy idea, right? It's going to sink <laughs> like a stone. <laughs> or, or a self-portrait. Um, so they're wonderful to watch. And the scene, you know, I always think that the islands give the best scenery because you've got the distant horizon. But the scenery from this town, this little town in the peninsula, um, partly, I think, because the cliffside had a lot of trees, cypresses and pines and olives. Mm. And I think it was the way the water picked up the colors from the land. It was the most beautiful shade of gray, green, blue I've ever seen. I could not take my eyes off. Yeah. It's just Shades, yeah, they are amazing. You know, I heard, I read a, uh, something, it shocked me. I mean, so Mani is a very rough area, she says, way at the mm -hmm. bottom of Greece. Part of my family is from quasi Mani. It's just a little bit over towards Sparta and below south of Sparta, but very harsh, very tough people, very, and uh, as you said, the feuds, where they, they would build their houses tall so they could put a cannon on top to shoot at each other. But in any case, a place so remote, I always imagined my whole life, uh, my, in my entire life, that these places in, you know, under the Ottoman rule were just remote outposts and they had no communication with the outside world. And then I read a book that shocked me. There was a huge trade from uh, Mani to Germany because what they had in Mani a lot of was these acorns. And in Germany, they had a lot of pigs. <laughs> and so these wooden <laughs> sailboats would come down, would come down and then the, the maniatas would bring the acorns to the coast, put them on these ships, and they'd go all the way up to the Rhine or wherever the hell they went. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, there are now a lot of Germans in the yeah. Mani. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of Germans in the Mani, yeah, yeah. I remember when we, when we were kids when we first arrived, so 1968, you could still feel the, there was the whiff of World War II still in the air, and certainly a whiff of the unspoken war, the Civil War. Right, it was very bitter, and, and you know. So, but uh, such that when we would be sitting in the village, you know, with you know our grand our grand uncles and all that stuff, if a German tourist, if some Germans passed through in their car with the German license plates, everybody would go mm, and stare at them as they drove through the village. They still despised Germans in those days because of the war. Yeah. So, are you going to go back again soon? I don't have an immediate plan, but I do want to go back. I got, um, you know, this was, it was not easy to write this book about Greek, and I had, I had this idea that writing about Greece, I'd be able to study Greek and um, get back into both modern and ancient and spend time in Greece. And I did do all of those things, but to actually finish the book, 
I, I, I couldn't study Greek and travel in Greece at the same time. I had to stay home and write the book mm -hmm. in English, do research and <laughs> um, suffer. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and I kept thinking, oh, I can't wait till I'm finished with this and I can take a vacation. Where shall I go? I wanted to go to Greece still. And that made me, that reassured me that I hadn't um, worn it out. So, so are, are you going to be traveling a lot more? Cause you, I think you're traveling abroad a lot for this book, no? I have, um, <clears throat> my publisher has sent me, um, is sending me, you know, I'm here. I'm going to my hometown, Cleveland, this weekend. And actually, that's kicking off six weeks away from home. Um, after Cleveland, I'm going to Nashville, where you may know there's a, a full-size replica of the Parthenon. Um, and I'm going to get to appear. I'm going to get to sign books in the Parthenon. I'm very excited about it. The funny like thing about the Parthenon in Nashville is, you know, how in Greece it's up on the Acropolis. In Nashville, it's in a hollow. <laughs> it's like they didn't get it. Nobody, none of the Southerners <laughs> want to climb, you know, and they also don't have a big rock the way that Athens says. And then I'll be going to the West Coast, to LA and, and Seattle and Portland, and then I'm going to Australia and New Zealand. Australia, and Melbourne? Melbourne, Sid Melbourne has this huge, huge Greek Greek population, <laughs> part of the, the great diaspora. I can't wait to hear Greek spoken with an Australian, Australian accent. <laughs> 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 now look, we're going to start taking questions, but before we do, I have a little surprise. She doesn't know this. She's been, I've had this bag with me the whole evening. In fact, Mary even held it, but didn't know that there's a surprise for you in here. Um, I'm going to first take out all of my paraphernalia here and then hand it to you and ask you if you wouldn't mind opening this in, inelegantly wrapped object and you'll see, I'll explain what it is. Oh, it's heavy. Yeah. Uh-oh, feels you know how, like... Remember she said how Greeks brag about the number of trees they have? <gasps> Wait a minute, this is yours, right? Oh, that's mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A melon? It's not oh, melon no, no, time. No, no. Thank God she's taking a train tomorrow, not flying. I'm not a famous, I'm not a very good rapper, but it could be a bottle of something, it. couldn't it? Hmm? Could be a bottle it of is something. A bottle. Now, ignore the label. Ooh. Ignore the label. Smell what's inside. The, forget the name. That was. The, uh oh, <laughs> did you do something? It's olive oil. Oh, beautiful! Thank for my, you. For my father's trees. Oh, how Hearth. wonderful! Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you can't buy this stuff in this town. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. You're this welcome. I thought I'd keep it as a surprise so for much. you. <laughs> Let me tighten it up so it doesn't leak on you. Yeah. Oh, it smells And I figured wonderful. this will be the waterproof in case somehow you drop it, then it won't get that all. All right, I don't drop pick it. it up carefully. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Ah, okay, here we go. How do you keep up your Greek ancient and modern? Do you have a favorite ancient author? Oh, this is from Bill. Uh, and a favorite ancient author, favorite modern Greek author, English or American writer on Greece? Well, I'll start at the end, okay? My favorite writer. On Greece um, is the writer Patrick Lee Fermer. Oh, who yeah. Has written uh, beautifully about Greece and also about Europe, and whose house I was bent on seeing when I went to Cardamili. Oh, that's where he, he yes. had his house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, he's a, a rhapsodic travel writer who, you know, when he wants to give an example of something, we're taught mostly when you want to give an example, you can say three things and that's enough. Most people, two is not enough, five is too many. Three things is just right. But when Patrick Lee Firmer gives examples, he rolls out a catalog. There's examples of the Greek diaspora, in fact, where he gives 91 different peoples. I counted them, Not a list of 91 things. So he's, and he's, and, it doesn't get boring. It gets better and better. It's mm. a crescendo, yeah, 91 yeah. things. That's yeah. pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, I guess I would have to say my favorite ancient writer is Homer. Um, that in the Iliad and the Odyssey, I've come to learn, and I should have known this sooner, are the Bible of the ancient Greek world. They have in them all the lessons, how to behave. I'm thinking now of Nestor. You know, Nestor is the old guy in the Trojan War who's always giving advice. And every time he appears on the scene, you know, everyone like yawns because <laughs> he's going to talk forever. Uh, but nobody is ever mean to Nestor. Nobody ever 
is disrespectful mm -hmm. to him. So that's a little tiny lesson embedded in there to, mm -hmm. you know, be nice to your elders. Um, <clears throat> what was the other? English American writer, Fimor, modern Greek author. The, <clears throat> I think you like one of the poets. Is this Kavafis you like? I love the poets, yes. Kavafis, um, Elitis, Odysseus, Elit mm -hmm. Elitis. Mm -hmm. This is something, and Obsephirus. Somehow the Greek poets have gotten lost, and they're, um, they have good translators, and they shouldn't be read. Uh, Lee asks, would you care to share your impressions of Madeline Miller's Song of Achilles, uh, oops, where did it go? particularly the evocation of living goddesses and of archaic language? Um, I'm not aware of that, are you? I don't. I, I don't know the Song of Achilles, but I do know Madeline Miller, and I do know Circe, and I know that she did a similar thing um, with Circe as she did with um, Song of Achilles, which is that she takes a um, scene, a figure, from mythology, and she made, for instance, with Circe, she made Circe the uh, heroine or the central figure of a big, long book in which Odysseus is just one episode. Mm. So that's just the opposite of mm. Circe's role in the Odyssey. Mm. And what Madeline Miller does, and I think she's a very good writer. She has a classical background and knows a lot. Um, I notice one of the things she does that's different from what I do, you know, she writes fiction, that's different. And what she did with Circe was take a myth and embroider it. And a lot of it was research, but a lot of it was imagined detail and make it very lush, make a tapestry out of it. So she worked with um, adding detail to mythology. And what I, what I do is I go for the details that are over there and that are real now, and I look for the mythology in, in the details mm -hmm. of actual life. And, you know, it cracks open most of the time and mythology comes out and that's very exciting. By the way, do you find yourself inadvertently copy editing there when you're reading a book like that? When I read? Yeah, let's say like her, for example. Do you find yourself going, oh, God, that sentence could be improved a little bit. <laughs> that's pretty good. You know, I, I am, um, when I first started copy editing, I could not read for pleasure. I oh. copy edited everything. And for, it was like two years before I got over that, but fortunately I did get over it. And now I, I might notice, so that's an odd use of the comma, but <laughs> it does not ruin the book for me. I, ski I move on, I skip it. And I don't, and I hope you don't either, write letters to the editor. <laughs> or the author. Complain or anything. Those, right, complaining so, letters. Anonymous. Anonymous, please raise your hand. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, give, which, another Greek word, by the way, just as uh, 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 rhapsodic is. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, given the broad presence of classical Greek culture in the West, do you find that contemporary Americans are still familiar with Herodotus, Homer, etc.? By which I assume you're asking anonymous, are they st adequately uh, familiar anymore? Is, I guess is your question. If I'm I think there's been a renaissance of um, in, in Greek mythology. I mean, you, the, home, the Homeric epics have been retranslated by several different academics and classicists and poets in the last 10 to 15 yeah, years. There have been several translations. translations. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of translations, retranslations of Herodotus. Herodotus is beloved, though. Um, one great, I, was, I read some Herodotus in Greek, but I read all of the histories in translation and... Um, you know, Herodotus is quite hilarious. I mean, he tells everything like going to Egypt and the kind of hooks they have for mummifying people, how they get the brains out from inside the nose <laughs> and stuff. Really, Ugh. And then you come to a passage that says, he's describing the Persian Pony Express, and it goes um, something like, neither rain nor snow, nor wind nor dark of night shall deter these faithful from in their Herodotus? Herod that is from Herodotus, and no it idea. is not the motto. It's, it's the architect of the post office put that on the building, but, it, but he didn't have the permission <laughs> of the post office to advertise that as their motto. So if, if you're not getting your mail during a blizzard. Blame Herodotus? They don't come around in blizzards. They're not crazy, you know. Yeah. So that was Herodotus, yes. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel, you know, it strikes me that we, there aren't more Hollywood movies 
placed in ancient Greece. We had the Trojan War with, what's his name, the... Yes, uh, which was pretty good, actually, I guess. And uh, but Brad Pitt, you know, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen Socrates in, a, in you know in, a, in an entertaining way depicted in film or the Peloponnesian Wars? I mean, I wonder why not. You could make some Peloponnesian great War would be wonderful. It did go on a while. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I saw um, a Rossellini film about Socrates years ago. And it oh. was wonderful. Yeah, you know, I mean, you know how Socrates was put to death by the state of Athens. Um, and there's a play going on right now in New York that is a version of that story of Socrates. Yeah. yeah, the trial and the apology of Socrates. Who played uh, Socrates in the Rossellini movie? Um, I mean, somebody was like Anthony Quinn or something? No, no, it was an Italian. I don't remember who. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay, Bill, how would you translate the first line description of what he says, polytropos? And, and the next question is about the same word. <coughs> oh, there you go. <coughs> okay, polytropos <coughs> means the poly is many, tropos is turn, and it's the word, it's the epithet associated most, the most associated epithet with Odysseus because he was very able to um, take advantage of situations. Um, I translate it myself as the man of many turnings. You know, I mean, he could turn his hand to anything. He could um, change a situation, and you know, the, he was sneaky. Um, the the it has been famously translated recently by Emily Wilson, who's the who translated the entirety of the Odyssey as complicated. The first line of her translation of the Odyssey is. Tell me about a complicated man. Hmm. And I got to say, that sounds like Johnny Cash to me. That, <laughs> not, that does not sound like Homer to me. Um, <clears throat> so complicated is one. Um, versatile is one. Uh, there, it's, my favorite is, I made it up myself, man of many turnings. But An adaptive. I always think it was adaptive, right? Adaptive like, is like, another. Whatever the circumstances, mm -hmm. he'll figure out something. Adroit. And creative. Yeah, yeah. Droid, yeah. yeah. There, it's, it's been translated something like a hundred ways. And I can only think of five, sorry. <laughs> was there a word in your book that you did the same thing with? You talked about the many, many translations of it. Well, there's the wine dark sea, of course, but no, there's a word. It was um, glafkopis, the yeah. epithet for Athena, which has, for many, many years, I don't know who first called her gray eyed, but for many years it was, it was gray eyed. And now it, it is more often translated as gleaming eyed or bright eyed. Again, Emily Wilson in her translation uses everything, flashing eyed, and somebody, some say silver eyed, and they do think that if it did, there's somebody who, who described it to me the, as um, not a color, but a quality, and if it was a color, it would be the color of wet stone. Just, you know, a, a f if it's gray, it would be a, a very smooth and shining, liquidy kind of gray. And then, and then the dictionary says, no, no, it's blue. <laughs> yeah. And then they're, oh, think of all the shades of blue. And then there's that theory that came out a few years ago. Some scientists thought that the Greeks did not see blue. Ah, that's right. That's, yeah, of course really? they saw blue. I mean, how could you miss the blue? <laughs> Maybe blue is to Greeks what water is to fish. You know, there's so much of it, and there are so many different shades of it. Well, they did put on a flag, and they do use the words a lot. They do the songs <laughs> all the time, so I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, it's funny, you mentioned the wet stone, and I thought, when you said that, God, there's a beautiful contradiction in that concept, because when you wet stone, it almost has depth, and yet you know stone has no depth. I mean, at least this, you can't penetrate the surface, right? <coughs> so here she's this powerful goddess. She's yeah. got this, she's this you know, hard eye. She's obviously a dangerous person, a god to mess with, and yet there's a the, the depth, the translucence is maybe a, a human yeah. kindness or something? I don't know. I think it, it may have some, you know, this um, glowing-eyed Athena, it may have some reference to her enthusiasm for the project of helping mortals. I like, yeah. you know, that it's a, an engaged eye. Athena is looking at you. If you happen to notice, she's flashing-eyed. Clearly, you're looking at her eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. It could be something like that. It's also in wine dark, the wine dark sea. Yeah. 
<clears throat> it, I used to think, why is that? Why are they calling the sea wine dark? The sea is blue. Wine is purple. But when I was on the Aegean and traveling on these ferries and looking at the sea, I could see what it meant. It's a quality, not a color. Wine dark means mysterious and with depths yeah. that it might be dangerous to yeah. go down too yeah. far into. So I think wine dark is about depths, and I think cloth copies is about surface. Yeah, 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 interesting. So Julia asks, how did you convince the New Yorker to give you five weeks off of work for your initial trip? And she is asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the New Yorker had the New Yorker was an enlightened place when I first started there. As soon you got a week's vacation, as soon as you were there, the next year you got three weeks vacation, and it was a while before you got five weeks vacation. But I borrowed a week from the next year is how I got five weeks vacation that time, and the next year, of course, I I didn't get four weeks. I got three, but I was able to go to Greece every other year in that way by borrowing time. So that, that fellow you mentioned, um, you didn't say his name, the guy who pulled the book, the Greek book off, he's a, he's a real fill-in. What was his name and how did he react once you'd come back now armed with knowledge oh, and experience? Wonderful. Ed Stringham was his name. He was an old beat. He'd been to Columbia at the time that um, Kerouac was there and Ginsburg and he hung around with all those people. He's even in some of their books, but he's always a depressed character in their <laughs> books. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm proud that I gave Ed a little bit of an afterlife by mentioning him in this book. He, he I, I think by the time I started going to Greece, I was, Ed was going vicariously through me. He was maybe in his 60s by then and all hunched over from having done this job leading over a desk for so many years. Um, but he was very excited when I started studying ancient Greek and very proud of me. He had friends who knew Greek. And when he told them my, my ambition in ancient Greek, which I did not fulfill, was I wanted to be able to cite, translate Thucydides while drunk. Oh, <laughs> that would wow. be something, That's right? a, quite an ambition. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. I got to the drunk part. <laughs> <laughs> Anonymous. Please raise your hand again. We said, oh, yes. The joke was only funny once, right? Anyway, can you share any examples of interesting or contentious copy editing issues? Is there a most memorable one? Well, I can speak broadly about New Yorker style and, um, you know, people who don't like um, the way we use a lot of commas or the way we put the diuresis over the second O in cooperative or the second E in reelect. Um, another thing, you know, the thing about a house style is it's, it's like a restaurant. You like a restaurant because you can trust it. It's always going to have these same dishes that you like, and they're always going to be prepared the same way, and there are no surprises. A house style in a magazine is the same way. It's always going to look about the same, and it's going to have the, the pros, if it's the New Yorker. We hope it's going to be of high quality and interesting, and of course, good cartoons, funny cartoons. Um, so, in the old days, it was you know there were no photographs. There were just cartoons and an occasional sketch that went a pen and ink sketch that went along with a profile. But it was just columns with spot drawings. You know those are those little things to break it up, and they were there to space it out. They were there to help make the columns fit the page. And the news breaks were also there. You know, those are those little mistakes from other magazines and oh, publications that the New Yorker would throw in. Yeah. Um, and then that would make us very self-conscious if we made a mistake ourselves, <laughs> of course. So what happened at the New Yorker, in my opinion, is that the tail came to wag the dog. Somebody decided all these spots should have a theme. And then you know, sometimes you'd have some little drawing on the page. And it was always our job to keep the drawings from reflecting on the prose or the prose you know, they had to be separate. Oh, okay. You couldn't have a, a piece about mud and have like somebody making mud pies in a cartoon. I think a piece about mud is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there were all, all these kind of classic things that the New Yorker used to do and then um, 
new editors came and added photos and color, and you know, and it still has, you know, it's it still looks pretty good, I think, but we would try to keep that classic look if we could. And one time a writer, <laughs> this, is, this is the only example I can think of, I'm sorry, it's really lame, but a writer wanted to, he had a reference to Mad Libs, you know, with that thing where, um, and he was trying to put it in the format of Mad Libs, that is, um, she called him, uh, parentheses, adjective, underscored parentheses, and you're supposed to fill in the adjective yourself. And you know, it was just a, a throwaway thing. It was just something he wanted to do. And I was happy to do that, but he wanted to make, he not only wanted to have the word in parentheses and underscored, but he wanted to make it bold face as well. And I said, we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, don't you ever want to do anything new and different? <laughs> and what could I say? No. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't want to do anything new. And it got a little nasty because I muttered under my breath because I was the one in charge of you know, putting the thing to press. After everyone goes home, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and he said, if that could, and he got really mad yeah. at that. That was very bad of me to do. And he got his way. And yeah. you know, so this little thing appeared in bold face and I thought it was ugly, but I don't think that anybody wrote any letters. Downhill letter. since then, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, that was the beginning of the end. So there's no more questions up here. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question into the microphone before we uh, wrap up for the night and go back to the food and desserts outside? Nope. Okay, well, I want to thank Mary Norris. I want to thank all of you for this uh, time. Well, I want to thank you, fun. Steph. It was really fun. <laughs> we had fun, yeah. And thank you so much. Yeah, oh, scrambled eggs, nice and slow. You'll love it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we found absolutely That's nothing <laughs> um, to, to kind of link that attack. But um, I think for, for the most part um, uh, that we've eventually found some sort of linkages. And so I think it's just an object of how long the investigation will be carried out to see, uh, to kind of unearth some of that. Right. So Zachary Abuser, let me turn back to you on something. Uh, uh, Amarnath just talked about